How's it going, Eliminators? Today, we're gonna to be talking about why it's important to check your oil on pretty much any of your outdoor power equipment. It's such an easy and quick thing to do, and it can prevent major catastrophic failures in your engine and save you lots of money. So with that being said, let's get right into it. So in the shop today, I have a Briggs & Stratton Intec V-Twin engine, and it has a very common problem, and that is going to be the governor, which controls the RPM on your engine, pretty much exploded. So you guys can see all the parts here. And this is a very common problem on a lot of these Briggs & Stratton V-Twin engines. However, the failure of this governor gear in particular was caused, I believe, by oil starvation. And I'm gonna take you through how I believe it failed, but first I'll briefly explain exactly how this governor system works because it's quite simple. As these gears are rotating, your governor gear right here rotates on that shaft. Now on top of this governor gear are going to be these counterweights here. Now those ones are completely exploded. However, they basically work off of centrifugal force. So as this gear starts to spin those counterweights move out and what it does is it lifts this little cap here. So coming over to the engine's oil pan, commonly referred to as a sump, the way this works again is when that little cap is raised, because we have to remember that this sump is going to be flipped and put down on the engine, that cap presses up against this governor arm right there. You guys can see that little mark where it's been wearing in. So as you rev up your engine, the gear spins, the counterweights move out, lifting that cap. The cap pushes on this and that controls the engine's throttle linkage. And in between the engine block and the governor gear is going to be this washer here. And you guys can see it also has grooves in it as well as the bottom of the governor gear itself. And essentially that just allows oil to go in and oil to go out so that the shaft that this governor gear spins on is properly lubricated. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. The reason that this failed on this particular engine was my customer ran this engine low on oil. What happened was this governor gear was not getting lubricated. And unfortunately, the governor gear seized to the shaft. Now, if you have a failed governor gear on one of these Briggs & Stratton engines, you can buy the entire governor gear kit and that part number is going to be a 793338. However, the issue is that that kit does not come with the shaft. So if you have an engine like I do here in the shop with a governor gear that seized to the shaft or it's possibly damaged the shaft, you won't be able to buy just that governor gear shaft itself. Unfortunately, Briggs & Stratton doesn't sell them as a separate part. They come with the entire engine block assembly, and that is going to be a part number 594162. Like you guys can see, that shaft comes with the cylinder block, and it comes pressed in from the factory. So why would I be showing you guys all of that? Well, the issue, again, with this particular engine is that the governor gear seized to the shaft. Now, I don't know if the governor gear shaft is damaged. However, what I can tell you is that because the gear seized to the shaft, my customer was running the engine and said all of a sudden it just started to rev really, really high and he didn't want to blow up the engine so he shut it right down, which was the smartest thing he could have done because it prevented further damage to the rest of the engine. So I'll put a picture up on screen to show you guys what the dipstick looked like when the mower was brought into me. You guys can see the oil's way down on the dipstick. This engine is probably about 30 to 35 ounces low on oil, and this particular engine takes approximately 64 ounces. So this engine only had approximately half its oil capacity. And again, like I said, when these governor gears fail, your engine will just rev wildly. However, I have come into a couple instances where the governor wasn't actually damaged and it was something to do with the carburetor. So I'll just basically take you through quickly how to diagnose that yourself. So inside of a carburetor, there's going to be what's known as a throttle plate, commonly referred to as a butterfly valve. And those throttle plates are held in place by just a tiny little screw. 
Now, a lot of times the manufacturers use some type of thread locking compound to secure those screws and pretty much make sure that they don't come loose. Now, I have seen instances, like I said, where the screw has backed itself off and the throttle plate has simply fallen out at which point it doesn't matter where your throttle would be, your engine would essentially be running at high RPM. Now the way to test that is very simple. You're going to grab a hold of your governor arm coming out of the engine, and when you fire up your engine, you're going to manually throttle your engine down. And if your engine throttles down and runs at a low RPM with you manually moving the governor arm, then you know that it's not a butterfly valve or a carburetor issue, you pretty much have ruled that out and narrowed it down to a failed governor gear. Now, if you guys ever do experience one of these governor gear failures on any kind of engine, the most important thing is going to be to shut the engine off immediately, like as soon as possible to, as I had mentioned previously, prevent further damage on your engine because I have seen these ones fail and I'll put a picture up on screen. Here's an engine that the governor gear failed and the customer was wearing some headphones while cutting. Didn't really realize that the engine had revved up so high and it ended up completely destroying both of the connecting rods. So you guys can see all the bits and pieces. The issue here that I am having is going to be, there is a little bit of damage to the actual hole that the shaft goes into. So you guys can see where the groove has been cut to allow oil to flow. You guys can see that the aluminum is just pushed over a little bit and it's created a little bit of a lip. So the first thing that I'm gonna have to do is take a file in here to ensure that that little groove goes all the way through and it's deep and it doesn't have that little ridge on it. Now you can buy replacement engines obviously, but they're gonna be super expensive. Here in Canada, this engine, the replacement one that's newer lists for $1,300, and I believe my cost is like $975. So while I do have a little bit of markup, it is still really expensive to go ahead and replace an entire engine for something as simple as just a failed governor gear that should be fixable. So the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna separate the governor gear shaft from the governor gear itself, and then I'm going to press down on the shaft because the gear is supposed to slide up and off of that shaft, right? So we wanna be punching it down, not from the bottom up. So using a hammer and a small punch, I was able to press the shaft out of the governor gear. You can see there is a little bit of scoring on the shaft, However, I should be able to clean that up. All right, so a little bit of update using some emery paper, which is very fine sandpaper, with some 10W30 in a spray bottle. I was able to clean up the governor gear shaft. Now, you guys are gonna notice it's a little shiny, and you will notice some dark spots right there where the gear was spinning. Now, those are going to be score marks in the shaft. So the governor gear scored the shaft itself, but that's actually a good thing because I was able to take all the high points off. That's all the shiny bits you see. And wherever you see a little bit of the dark spots there, those are going to be low points, right? But the main thing here is that it's perfectly smooth and that there's no high points in it to grab the new governor gear. Next up, I'm taking a square file and I'm using the angled corner of one end to take out the little edge that was there, that's gonna be good enough because again, that allows oil to go through those oil galleys or grooves that are cut in there to get into lubricate the gear. So I just wanna take those high spots off. Obviously, I'll face this or surface it with a, a file this way to take off that little edge there. And then I still have the edge on the back side. Try to get a shot of that one. That one's a little bit higher, but you guys can see that I've already done that one there and that's good enough. We're just trying to eliminate that little ridge. Now using a mini file set is gonna be great for this. I have a 12 piece kit made by Central Forge. There's the part number P4614. You guys can check this out if you want, but they have flat ones, they have uh, some round ones, they have some uh, tapered ones, and then and some are coarser and some are finer. So for instance, right now I'm using one of the coarser flat files to take off the high points here, you guys can see I've already cleaned up the oil grooves. So if you do find that you run into a situation like I had where the oil grooves 
were deformed just a little bit near the hole. Just taking that sharp edge on the file, clean them up nicely. And then again, we cleaned up the top surface as well to smoothen that out. Now, as for the hole itself, it is not what's known as a through hole. So this is only drilled into a specific depth because we have our cylinder underneath there. So there was a whole bunch of oil at the bottom of the hole. So I just used a Q-tip to go in there and just clean it out the best I could. So you guys can see all the oil that was on the bottom of that shaft there. We don't want any of that on the shaft when we go to install it permanently because we don't want that thing coming out. Now this shaft here is going to be what's known as symmetrical. So it has bevels on the top and the bottom. And then it has these two grooves that are evenly spaced apart. Now. Here is where I may have to start thinking outside the box to end up repairing this engine. Like I said, this is not a through hole, so it's drilled to a very specific depth. The issue is that when the gear seized to the shaft, it started spinning in there and it started to waller out the hole larger than what it's supposed to be. And that's an issue because this shaft is only supposed to go into a specific depth and the hole is actually drilled deeper and I believe it's tapered. So you can end up installing this shaft lower than what you're supposed to. And that's gonna be an issue because when you go to put your gear on top of the shaft there, obviously the washer is gonna be there. So it's gonna take up a little bit of space. Then you're gonna put your gear down and I'll show you the new parts after, but they use a clip here that goes right into that bevel there and it locks itself into the groove that has been machined into that shaft. So obviously if the shaft is too low, the gear is going to be sitting too high on the shaft and you won't be able to lock your clip in, which means that gear won't be held onto the shaft. So that thing could end up coming right off and that's not good. Now I was lucky enough to reach out to a friend of mine and he had one of these Briggs & Stratton V-twin engines taken apart and I had him measure the depth from the base here to the top of the shaft and I'll put a picture up on screen there for you guys and it measured exactly one and a half inches. So he took a couple different pictures and from what I can tell the cutout on the shaft sat right around there. Now I'm obviously going to measure this but here's where we might run into the problem. You guys can see that the top of that shaft from this thing spinning in there has wallered itself out and if we go deeper that thing is not moving now however it's a little too low. All right, so what I chose to do was weld the shaft at the one end. And the reason I did that is because I can put this in a lathe and I can take the weld material down. Now, basically what that's gonna allow is for me to hammer the shaft in and have it pressure fit on the hole itself. So it'll give me some bite around the sides. And then what I'm gonna be doing is before I tap it in, I'm gonna be putting in just the smallest amount of JB weld because I don't have a TIG welder, so I can't make my welds like really, really nice. I'm using just my MIG welder. So you guys can see where I've welded here and I've welded there, and this is a low spot. Anywhere that you see a dark spot is gonna be a low spot. That's actually gonna work out perfect because I'm hoping that will give the JB weld something to grab onto. All right, so the update is I took the shaft, put it on a lathe, and turned down the outside diameter. Now, like I said before, all of those darker spots are gonna be low spots, which is actually gonna be perfect because it will give the JB weld something to grab onto. Now, if I put the other side in, you guys can see just how much that goes in, right? Because the top of that hole had been kind of wallered out, right? So it wiggles quite a bit. But if we flip it and we put the welded side in, it starts to get tight right about there. So my groove is about here. So I figure it'll give me about a quarter inch to tap that in and give it a nice pressure fit. With the addition of a little bit of JB weld in the hole before I tap that in, this thing should be permanent and should not come out, fingers crossed. And hopefully I can end up saving this engine for my customer and preventing him from having to spend $1,300 for a replacement engine. All right guys, so I mixed up some JB weld put it onto the shaft, tapped it in, and I'm using, once again, my vernier caliper as basically a depth gauge. I'm right at my inch and a half. The JB weld is setting, and this stuff is supposed to set within four minutes, so I'm trying to work quickly. 
I have a piece of a popsicle stick I broke apart and used the thinner end to uh, put some JB Weld in the bottom of the hole. And I also put some JB Weld onto the shaft, hammered that in very lightly using just a, a small hammer here. And I didn't need that one, but I put that one there just in case. Things are looking good. The shaft is very sturdy and I'm gonna show you basically how I lined everything up. Uh, I used this smaller piece here to dig out any JB Weld that hadn't set in my oil grooves. I can always go in there and clean that up a little bit, but the most important part is going to be that groove on the shaft on the bottom is clean because that's what, again, lets the oil in. Now I took the washer out just to show you guys our alignment here. You guys are gonna notice that that is as far in as the governor gear can go into the cam gear. And basically uh, things are looking good. And then the groove at the top is in the perfect height to allow the new ring to go on there once we put the cap down and seat that into position. So the JB Weld takes approximately four minutes to set. And basically that means that you have about four minutes to uh, make any fine adjustments that you need. So it's pretty much in the spot that I want it to be in. So we're now going to let it sit for it. 15 to 24 hours. I'm gonna let it sit maybe a day or two even because I'm not in a big rush with this. I wanna have it fully cured, which it will be after 24 hours, at which point the JB Weld has a tensile strength of over 5,000 PSI and can withstand temperatures up to 550 Fahrenheit. So this engine's not gonna get anywhere near that hot and I don't think there's going to be over 5,000 PSI of load on that shaft. Essentially, that shaft just basically uh, lines up the gear. There's not a lot of uh, sideways force and there's not a lot of up and down force because the only thing that happens is when the counterweights move out, the cap is what's pushing on the governor arm itself. So fingers crossed again, you know, I know I've been saying that, but I'm really hoping that this thing holds and that it does not come out. However, this engine does burn a little bit of oil. So once again, I'm gonna tell my customer to check the oil every now and then. And if he only has to put in, you know, a couple ounces every month or so, then that's way cheaper than spending $1,300 on a new engine. Well, that's gonna wrap up today's video. However, I did wanna mention that if you wanna see me tear one of these engines down or learn how to put it back together, I do have videos on my channel that show that. So I will link it in the top right of your screen as well as at the end of the video. But with that being said, today's video was more or less to show the importance of why you wanna check your oil. For something that literally takes 10, 15 seconds, you pop your hood, pull the dipstick on the engine. If you have oil in your engine, go ahead and fire up your engine and go cut your grass. If it's a riding lawnmower, whatever it is that you're gonna be firing up and running. If your engine needs a couple of ounces of oil every now and then, like I said, it's no big deal and it's really not that expensive. With that being said though, if you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up, you know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week, so be sure to stop on by next week, check channel out for new content, and as always guys, thanks for watching.